Welcome to Three Professors and a Primary Source, the historian's toolkit for interrogating primary sources. Three Professors and a Primary Source is an exercise that shows students how historians do history. Historians interrogate a source for six pieces of information. They use this information as the basis of their analysis of the source. This video introduces pre-service high school teachers to the initial six interrogatory questions that historians apply to every source. They are. First, who is the author? Second, what is the date or approximate date of the document? Third, what is the subject of the document? Fourth, what is the purpose, motivation, or ideas the document conveys? Fifth, who is the intended audience? And sixth, what are the biases or agenda of the author? In other words, what does this document leave out? This sounds like a lot, but observe three professors who are presented with a mystery primary source. Before today, these three professors have never seen this source. Watch them use this historian's toolkit of questions on a mystery document. Read the document for yourself and see if you agree. Another remarkable thing about this that, that occurs to me is that this uh, uh, address was delivered by Indira Gandhi mm -hmm. and to um, Coretta King, Dr. King's uh, widow. And so it, it features at a moment in history when in, you're in the midst of the women's lib mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. uh, two women who have emerged on the world stage as leaders in their own right. So that <clears throat> if you could view this in a completely different context apart from martyrdom and the cause of, of nonviolent resistance to uh, injustice and, and wrongheadedness in, in government decisions. You could uh, contextualize it in terms of that, that very 19, late 1960s, 70s movement, the women's, uh, women's movement. And, and these two, in a, in a, in a way that, that we kind of take it for granted, we, we were post-Margaret Thatcher and, and uh, Hillary Clinton <laughs> and all of that kind of, uh, but at the time, I think it was uh, to have a prime minister, a head of state. That uh, was very unusual, and especially unusual in India without the connection to, without the name uh, Gandhi and the connection to Nehru and all of that, it would have, uh, it probably would not have happened. And this at a moment, 1969, 68 was the year Martin Luther King was assassinated, but it was also the year that John, or not John, but Robert Kennedy was assassinated. I think that uh, George Wallace was shot that year. The violence just, and the Vietnam War was, was in its heyday. Uh, it, it was an awfully violent time in, in many respects, uh, and with television amplifying it all, as I recall. 69, I was 14 old enough to, you know, to, to watch and, and um, think, <laughs> what, what's going on? What kind right. of world am, am, right. am I a part of? Um, you mentioned, John, you mentioned the fragility of the situation and, and the violence and the, and the opposition to human rights movements globally. And, and I'm struck by that as well in the document that here we are uh, just less than a year after Dr. King had been assassinated in Memphis. And it's what's one thing that strikes me again as an Americanist is the way in which Dr. King had begun to, for lack of a better word, kind of lose control, lose leadership mm. of the civil rights movement in the United States to Malcolm X, uh, to the Black Panthers and other, and other um, civil rights activists who were also influenced by events abroad. Malcolm X had traveled widely. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam War was ongoing, right. and many civil rights activists uh, opposed the war in Vietnam, not just because they thought it was unwinnable, but mm -hmm. they objected to it on moral grounds mm -hmm. and saw it as a race war, as a war of colonial oppression. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad Ali and others who were deeply influenced by the black sure. power movement refused to fight. So I'm also struck by, as we've talked about, um, the way in which Dr. King, and it was a global movement, but the way others 
who had different views uh, and, and of what what equality meant and how to achieve it, um, Malcolm X and others were also influenced by um, kind of global approaches to human rights at the same mm -hmm. time. So to me, especially as you say, in 1969, in a U.S. setting, this movement or movements, plural, for human rights were, were really at a fragile point. Everything was had changed and was certainly starting to change and would continue to do so. Uh -huh. One thing, just at a more simplistic level that occurs to me, if, if you were to interpret this, it would seem that you'd need to know a fair amount about um, uh, Mohandas Gandhi's thinking because there's a reference to the Satyagrahi. Mm -hmm. I was hoping and, you would and bring of course, that up. Of course, I know, I know you know, and Todd, you probably know, but your, your high school teacher might or might not know, and almost certainly your high school student will not know. There are not that many uh, references, but some of this needs to be, you'd have to contextualize, you'd have to go beyond the, the document itself. And the poignancy of the, of the fact that this is delivered by Indira Gandhi, and that she also falls victim to the same violence that, that Gandhi had, that Martin Luther King had, and then before it's all over with, her son. And similarly, I'm struck by the same thing that's happening in the American context is uh, King's kind of uh, philosophy of nonviolence as a tactic to achieve racial justice and equality. Um, new, a new and younger generation of civil rights activists in 1969 and earlier, uh, again, Malcolm X and the Black Panthers mm -hmm. and Stokely Carmichael and so on, had begun to question that and, and to argue that Dr. King's appro nonviolent approach had achieved a good number of things, to be sure, but there were still a number of things left on the table. So Dr. King's nonviolent approach had addressed uh, legal or de jure segregation in the South. That was, on paper at least, null and void. But it hadn't addressed de facto segregation uh, throughout the country, and it hadn't addressed persistent racial economic inequality. And so though that younger generation of civil rights activists, and it sounds like in other places in South Africa and Mandela as well, had begun to question that strategy and to wonder if nonviolence could in fact achieve everything or if another approach, uh, as Michael Max said, achieving equality and racial justice through any means necessary, through a program of kind of black empowerment, and only through that way, uh, through separatism, rather than integration, which had been Dr. King's goal, that would be the way uh, to the future. Whether they were right or not is an open question, but yeah. I'm struck by this global conversation. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that that, that resort to, to something beyond uh, nonviolence or ahimsa in, in uh, uh, Gandhi's language was not something that he would ever have endorsed, nor, nor Martin Luther King, to my knowledge, nor was it something that Fukuzawa endorsed. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but they... I think they all were agreed that, that you compromise your ends when you, when you take uh, the means of the opposition and that the, the best course is martyrdom. And it might take more than you, but, but over time that will, be, that will be a statement that just does not go away. One of the interesting facets of any primary source is the audience to whom the document is written. And it's clear that this is not only written to the recipient, uh, Martin Luther King's wife, uh, but uh, it's written for the world. It's written for India. There's an Indian audience here. Uh, and uh, there's, a, as you've pointed out, uh, there's the audience in the United States. Uh, everyone is involved in civil rights, not just African Americans. What strikes me about it and is the way in which um, it speaks to the extent to which Dr. King and the civil rights movement in the United States, so as an American historian, this kind of jumps out at me, is the way in which the document speaks to the fact that Dr. King in particular and the civil rights activists, generally speaking, um, learned, uh, received ideas from non-Americans, including uh, Mahatma Gandhi, um, and the ways in which the, the civil rights movement in the United States was part of a larger kind of global conversation about human rights. 
Th this presentation uh, that uh, she gives uh, is about five years after Nelson Mandela was convicted of treason uh, in South Africa, four to five years, something like that. And it's interesting that, as you pointed out, Satyagraha is raised here, and Nelson Mandela's organization, the African National <coughs> Congress, had adopted that for, uh, from its beginning, mm -hmm. uh, since 1912. It, they were always uh, nonviolent. And uh, one of the uh, issues related to Satyagraha, to take this and develop this further, as you have done with some other topics here, uh, is when to abandon that. It, the, the idea behind uh, Satyagraha is to shame your opponent into acting differently, uh, into accepting you as a human being. But if they refuse to be shamed, if all they do mm. is shoot you down, mm. then perhaps you need to add something mm -hmm. uh, to get their attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that was added, uh, was sabotage in the context of mm. the ANC. Mm. And, and uh, this comes up. Uh, in, in the trial, and, and no doubt uh, that the participants here in this speech knew very well uh, about this uh, in, in South Africa. So uh, sometimes uh, satagraha, usually it works, uh, but if you come from a society that has uh, is dominated by white supremacy, that the people who don't look like them are somehow uh, another breed, as Mandela described it, uh, in his trial, and then another tactic it must be adopted. And in a sense, he was carrying out treason. He was mm -hmm. really, in a sense, trying to overthrow the government <laughs> yeah. uh, with force. Right. In this, this case, sabotage. Not that it was kind of a compromise between satagraha uh, and, and violence, and that it wasn't intended to hurt anyone. It was just intended to persuade people to vote right. differently in the next election.